So welcome. Welcome to the grand finale of our workshop. It's all built towards this. And I certainly hope that you feel, you know, curious and open-minded and excited. At the same time, you might find that what we're doing isn't too complex. Not that that should deflate you. But to have everything come together that we've done is just a natural result of what we've done and who we are as Dungeon Masters. And let's go... Uh, we have our prompts, we have our references. That was our, our last segment. Pardon me. And where do we start? Sindrin, thank you very much for the follow and welcome. I'm glad you found us and gave us a chance. You know where we're going to start? I'm going to go over here to... Uh, I'm going to go over here to this uh, spreadsheet... And I am going to type tides. Uh, it looks like it's hidden behind the, the wreath decoration. But tides? What the heck? What do the tides have to do with, with political intrigue? Uh, Reezy, thank you very much for the follow. <laughs> what? Yeah, beautiful blank spreadsheets. What do tides have to do with political intrigue? What do they have to do with... Uh, what do they have to do with our half-barbarian, half-ranger Hunter's Guild member? What do they have to do with, uh, uh, you know, uh, court wiles or, or the like? Well, tides may very well have a big influence on our environment. And they're going to they're going to help in our event based adventure. As tides come and go, you know, Machi was talking about putting bodies in giant wheels of parm cheese. The sea can take bodies out if necessary, can hide treasure, can open up access to hidden flooded tombs. It's also something that we understand. We understand as DMs. And in a world of fantasy and magic and such, let's start with something that is universal. Why do we have our spreadsheet open? Because we are going to have a list of events that occur. Because the world continues on around the player characters. The machinations are happening around and over the players, especially at the beginning. Maybe not so much at the end. Hey, Ikiru. Welcome. And so here we have... Let's make this a... Um... You know, let's make this, uh, if if it's a month, okay? Doesn't have to, I don't know what a month is in your, your fantasy world. If we just say it's 30 days, we can have a simple note that maybe in this world, there are, um, there are three tides. So it actually, you know, over two days, you actually have the full, like, back and forth slush of the water. Maybe that's something that's cool and unique. Maybe because if there's a second moon. You see all the, the coulda wouldas that are drifting from here, from the tides. If you think about the uh, tides in our saltwater estuary, or how far up does, you know, how does the brackish water flow? This is actually kind of suspense. We, we want some suspense. I, I don't want this much suspense in our music. Let's get something there. This is going to be better. All right. Yes, temperature, the the weather, and uh, and Jenna, that would be especially true. You know, if if a storm comes in and you want to run a scenario, you know, if you know that there's a bad storm coming in in a week and a half, as the DM, you can prepare for that. The storm's going to happen regardless of what the PCs do. 
So you come over here and along the top, just start listing things that exist. Tides. Weather. How about the, um, you know, build it from from the the breathing cycle, the heartbeat cycle of the sea to something a little bit more broader and tempestuous. What about, oh, holidays? Civic or religious holidays? Reezy, you're absolutely welcome. You come over here, because the holidays are going to happen regardless of what your, your player characters do. And if you, if you can present that they exist and they could be interacted with, it could be a route to get them more information about the intrigue, a way for them to get clues, a way to introduce something happens. You know, during a big festival, someone apparently falls from the top of a, a tall building and is no more. Was it really what happened? Were they really a drunken reveler at a holiday? Or was someone pushed? Or was someone pushed? These are broad things. You can continue this across and uh, and go, um, you know, uh, you could have wildlife migration. You can have other things um, that are a, a bigger part of the world. Uh, oh, another one. Do you have a moon or moons? Moon cycles. What are your moon cycles? That could possibly be relevant. Now, I don't want you to waste a bunch of time. If you're a DM, you're like, yeah, there's one moon. You know, I can, I'll, I'll set it and then we'll just, you know, we'll use Earth cycle and go from there. That's fine. This is an exercise to show you different ways that you can establish your campaign setting and the events that are going to take place, especially in Intrigue. Now we come over to... We come over to our... Our villain. Now, obviously, our players aren't going to see this timetable or aren't going to see or know about all aspects of it. Our villain, at least at the start of the adventure, our vi our PCs aren't going to, you know, in, uh, have any sort of command or sway with our villain. Our villain has machinations that are just going to happen. And until the party gets more clout or finds some clues, that the happenstances of the villain are going to continue on without without anything needing to, to occur, and the party can learn about them on the back end when the news comes out from the town criers or however you disseminate information. So, what do I mean? Tides? If we say there's three tides a day, I don't know, a, a day could be 24 hours. You want to keep it regular? There's a, a tidal cycle every eight hours. Okay. You can do that if you want. You make it four. You could make it one. Maybe it's a very slow slosh, but it lasts a long time. So low tide is actually a good time to move because you don't have to be in a rush. You could actually walk along the the bottom, the um, um, muddy bottom. The, you could be the soggy bottom boys in the estuary for, you know, you, you get a good like six hours of uh, super low tide before it starts, you know, creeping back up. Again, think about your world. It's a great prompt for that. And then you come down here and you can make your you can make your schedule on an hourly basis, you know, so this could be 8 a.m., 9, 10, or this is in our month. Let's just call it 30 days for this example. Every day, you have the next month planned out. That way, You've put up the work up front as a DM. Pardon me. Now, in a game of intrigue, let think let the let the chips fall. So we know the tides are in and out. This is maybe more of an hourly, or you can put that uh, maybe in your world. Every uh, if we have a, a three cycle, let's say, um, it actually builds and the tides get worse uh, until there's some sort of a breaking point where like things like super flood over and then it, it it steadies back out. You know, so here, if that's the case, maybe we have normal tides and we have normal for, uh, we have normal for eight days. 
And then we start getting into... Um, then we start getting into, I don't know, make up a word or, or look up something. We, we get into a, um, a climaxing tide for three days. Then for the next two days, uh, you have some kind of like super tide. And what this could mean is if the super tide comes in, Unless you have, uh, I don't know, a boat or some other form of transportation, maybe some of our bridges are just submerged or locked out. Or uh, there's sort of a martial law is decreed every super tide to make sure people are safe. And, and the super tide changes the rules of the game for your villains, for your PCs. And then we can have, um, we can have like a waning tide. And maybe the maybe it, it takes uh, less time for the waning tide to go out, if you, or if you want to keep it, boop like a bell curve, then sure extend it one more boop day, and then we go back to normal tides. And it's not that there's not a low tide during our super time. Low tide is our high tide during normal, and then it comes back to. And then we have waning. Now we have an environmental factor. Now let's go to weather. You can randomly roll for this. You can just say, yeah, you know what? This is, it's Southern California. Every day is sunny. Every day is the same. Same temperature, same weather, same sun, same whatever. It's all the same. Every day is the same. And you could put that boop, 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 all the way down. Hey, coffee cat. You can preload it and just go, you know, sunny, partly cloudy, etc. Or if you only want to list certain events, a 5% chance of new weather the next day. Yeah, come up with a system. All right, Samus, be well. Or if you only want to list major events, then say you could roll it or just decide, you know what, on the 6th, uh, we're having... I'm going to put T-Storm. And then here, we're going to put T-Storm. And then we're going to have... Um, by the end, So th this is building. And then by the end of the month... And of course, right when we're having... Um, you know, when we're having the swelling tide... You know, b before people get a chance to, to move and do all this... While the, the tide is in a climaxing state... This is when a hurricane hits, or a typhoon, or whatever you'd want to classify it as. Or if you want this to be hurricane, this could be, um, you know, whatever. Uh, Pre-hurricane. Hurricane. And then we have, like, two days of aftermath. Post-H... Post H. And the days in between can be sunny or breezy or whatever you'd like. But now you see, okay, I, we can start seeing what's happening in our world as, we, as we're going to present it to our players. Now, what about holidays? Well, wouldn't you know this month is the month, um, you know, if, if there's a lot of, uh, if we're in hurricane season or the, the, there's uh, more moisture in the air, um, there's a lot more warmth. Uh, maybe it's a, it's just a time of, uh, it's a time of renewal or something. So we have some sort of spring festival and you can randomly roll for it. Or you could have decided this before you decided the weather, or you could say, you know what? It doesn't really matter to me up front, but what if there's a thunderstorm on, um, I don't know. There's like a, the, the weekend, you can even put holidays as weekend and we can say, you know what? So we have weekend weekend and you just load that in so this would be like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday Thursday, Friday and then we have weekend, weekend 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 weekend, weekend 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 weekend hmm 
One, two, three, four, five. Weekend, weekend. However, we're going to have a holiday weekend, which is unfortunately going to take place over the course of a thunderstorm, and we're going to call this a uh, high feast. Now, again, we could spend so many other workshops detailing. I'm throwing out examples because I, I want to make a point about how this is going to uh, play into our, our campaign outline. So we have, uh, we have high feast, and of course, before high feast... Um, we actually uh, we actually would end up having um, then a period of fasting afterwards, um, and so this would be high fast after high feast. That'd be kind of like Mardi Gras before Lent, if you want to, you know. In, in fact, high fast can even be uh, you you could have several columns of holidays for whatever faiths that you would like to have in your environment. And uh, then we could just continue high fast down. However, after this holiday weekend, uh, while this is uh, this is high fast, uh, this particular day we also um, this starts. It could start a secular holiday. Um, so we're gonna call this uh, high fast slash. Um, open waters and this is the start of the fishing season uh or maybe it's for a particular type of fish or something so it is it is high fast and on this last day of fasting we can go out into the world uh you know it, it's when the fish are considered to be replenished and then wouldn't you know we get back to this and uh oh shoot you know what right as the hurricane is hitting wouldn't you know it we have the high holy day of well, i don't know Let's check out our uh, let's check out our party. What are some prompts? What are some beliefs? You all you can always source back to your character sheets that are submitted to you as a dungeon master by your players. Um, so we have a farmer. We have a former farmer girl. So you know maybe this is some kind of a harvest festival that happens, and of course. Uh, or harvest, maybe it's planting if we want it to be springtime. How about that? And wouldn't you know, like right in the middle of the week, not that it gives everyone a day off, but this would be, uh, th this would be our planting, plant time, plant time. And it's a day that usually people spend outside to say, you see how we're building a culture, but unfortunately, oh, there's a hurricane. All right, now the moon or the moons. It like the tides, you could have it, you know, you can have it cycle whenever you want. So if you want to have it, um, if you want to have it cycle, if you have a 30 day month, uh, maybe like the tides, uh, because of the tides, the way that it cycles is a part of things. Uh, and you can have it be regular. You can have, you, if you want to have four full moons a month, have four full moons a month. This is your world. You know, if it starts here and, and you say like half waning and then three quarters waning and then new, uh, you could have it take one day, two days for each of the cycles. Have it be what you'd want it to be here and develop your world because now that can spill into religion, custom, economy. This can influence when your uh, characters that can see in the dark have uh, no penalties in dim light because of a full moon. Uh, Jenna says, call the holiday giving where you give people... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, like, people uh, people trade, like, the, the they're proud of their gardens or something. So instead of plant, I'm sure we'll call it giving because people give each other their prized seeds to plant for the upcoming uh, summer. I like it. See, Jenna? We're... we're and, and, and that would be something that this particular character can identify with. In fact, probably also Wofax as well. Now, if you weren't around for the characters, just trust me. By, by just having these prompts, we're drawing our characters in. We're giving different things that our characters can glom onto, react to, or otherwise understand. Mystery Cycle, hello. Bad Omens. It's Mystery Cycle, yes. Bad Omens. 
So come up with your moon cycle. You know, uh, or even if you only want to just note when the the when we have a full moon, because you as the DM want to make it relevant. Um, you know, you just put full moon at. Uh, we'll say a full moon here, and we'll just say it. It happens every ten. Uh, uh, whatever, every fifteen days, arbitrary, arbitrary. So full moon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And, it, you know, if you want to continue this down, go ahead. Yeah, if you start messing with the stars and the moon or something along those lines. And, uh... Tavern Tales, thank you for joining us. Cheers to you. And also, Tavern Tales, like fancy flower bulbs, the first stock market was uh, in Holland about tulip bulbs. People were speculating on tulip bulbs years in advance. Now, this is where we, we started out with broad concepts that can help define the world. Here... And again, especially in an intrigue-based adventure, though it doesn't have to be, plot out what your villain's going to do. Right now, our villain doesn't know the heroes, doesn't care about the heroes, and there's probably little to no chance that there's going to be any meaningful interaction between the two. In the circumstances that have developed around the characters and all of the other things then that have derived from our characters, we know the villain is effectively already won. The villain is the puppet master of the dictator. Everyone loves the face of the dictator, which is fine. Everyone is fine with that rule. Though the dictator is being manipulated by the vizier or whomever in the court. You know, kind of like the Sultan Jafar thing that we, we brought up um, the other day. The villain technically has already won and is reaping the benefits. This could simply be, uh, you know, small goals. This could be travel. Uh, it doesn't even have to be a grand plan to you know, summon the moon down on the town like Majora's Mask or whatever. You can simply, if we already are under, with the understanding that the villain has won and is just riding out the long game, trying not to mess stuff up because she already has what she wants. So the villain on this day is, uh, is going to be, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the weekend. Uh, and so the villain is, uh, leaving for, uh, leaving for the neighboring town. So we'll put uh, out of town. Oot. Comes back just in time for High Feast. Pardon. Over here, we can make the note that our villain uh, meets with... Uh, meets with uh, one of the NPCs. Now, of course, I mean, you could... You could... Here, well, we'll just, like, extend this this way. Uh, out, oot, oot in a boot, out of town to, uh, the inland. Visiting a patron. Of course, we have two warlocks in the party. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, returns in her carriage. Uh, having been, I don't know, uh, returns in her carriage having been, uh, attempted robbery. So she's returning in her carriage. There's a thunderstorm brewing. The carriage driver is waylaid, uh, on the road back to town. Because look, this happens to the villain because no one knows she's the villain. And that's the point. And you could use this then as a point where you hear, oh yeah, you know, th there's rumors. So like down here, a day or two later, there's rumors going around that the vizier, uh, someone tried to rob the vizier's carriage. And then the player character like, oh, you know, that vizier is not too bad. It's a shame that good things happen or uh, bad things happen to good people. Waka waka. Meets an NPC. 
of some variety. And you can just have meets NPC uh, here or there. Now, let's say that she's enacting a particular plan. Maybe she wants to secure more power. So here, we have high fast and right on open waters when, when people are out celebrating, our villain wants to make her move. And of course, if you set it up this way too, if you have players or their characters that look at the research behavioral pattern, maybe they'll find out, wow, the Vizier seems to be very busy on holidays. Why could that be? Now, of course, that could just be chalked up to, well, it's a holiday. Of course, the Vizier would be inaccessible. And then when you go back and look at clues later in the game, well, oh, this is a, no, no, this isn't just being busy. There's a direct pattern. And you know what? You've helped yourself as a dungeon master by making a simple spreadsheet about the events that are playing out in this month, let alone if you just wanted to copy it and, and make months to come. You know, meets an NPC uh, to acquire uh, meets an NPC to acquire, I don't know, we'll say uh, fishing rights to the bay. Whatever that means. Uh, to you, it might mean something because you're writing it down. We're having to, you know, take a little... We're RPing as DMs here. And this could end up being... Uh, th this could be the, uh, ac the, the process. And you just know that the acquisition... Acquisition day one. And it, it goes down and it's going to take her ten days... Or whatever, nine days. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days. Acquisition finished. And now, the day or two after this, oh, the vizier acquired. Uh, the, the vizier is now like kind of like the harbor master to the fishermen of the of the saltwater estuary here of the inner bay or whatever. Oh, all right. Interesting. I don't know why the Vizier would be interested in that, but hey, there you go. And of course, if you can control the who can come and go into a particular place, you can hide things or people. You can move more freely. These are clues. These are things that can add up. And if you have a courtier like you do, Diggs and Nomiel is a courtier. If you have someone who has connections in the court as a courtier... Having a reference list about things that you can hear or know what people are talking about can be very handy, and you're not going to scramble as a dungeon master to know, ah, oh, what do I do? Rosie the Posy, welcome. Thank you for the follow. Yeah, it, there will be duties and routine. You're absolutely right, Shadow. Cackling maniacally 24-7. So th that's just its own column. We'll just type cackle and boo, just drag it down. Uh, tavern. Yes, uh, I personally do, uh, for gods and religion, uh, the, a creation myth, a creation myth is a foundation for a society, whether it's religious or even civic. Now, I mean, I say that kind of blends the two. There is a creation myth around the city of Rome. The city of Rome is a real place in our modern day and historically. Rome exists. I think we can all agree on that. The city of Rome has a creation myth to it, let alone the myths that were imported from Greece for the Roman gods explaining natural phenomena in the world. The creation myths, the religions then spawn perhaps uh, agnostic philosophy, if not religious philosophy, which can then, as society continues on, bleed into, um, you know, uh, uh, scientific, logical research that isn't faith-based but through logical conclusion and application to get the gist of things. The creation myth. I mean, look at the United States. While we take it for history, we treat the founding of our nation with the awe and reverence of a creation myth. We have our founding fathers, you know, these near deific people who are very important, who made sacrifices, uh, whose intelligence and lives 
uh, act as examples of ways to think or things to do or not to do and can give us reflection on, on today's society. And this is history that's not, you know, it's, uh, well, it's a little over 200 years now, unless you want to go back to Pilgrim times. But even then, maybe the Pilgrim times is the creation myth, and then we transition into the agnostic philosophy, as our nation was founded on agnostic philosophy. So yeah, I, I find it's it's very good. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to write, you know, an inch of paper's worth as a foundational religious document. Come up with a story about where things began. Did this start as a little fishing port? You know, uh, you got some settlers that came in and they just, maybe there's a unique fish. And now we're building the ecology too, by the way. Um, there's a unique fish or perhaps a swamp grass that lives in the estuary. Something that made this place rich and worthwhile to live in. It made the settlers want to come here and stay here and thrive here. And now it's just ingrained as a part of the society. Uh, Jenna, yeah. Uh, and all of this can be... A, your PCs may never really put together everything, but this helps keep you in the know and to keep you organized. You know, do your player characters want to take seven days of downtime to forge a sword? Let them. If they start forging here, you know, if this is a column that says downtime. Or if you just if we do this downtime, then we'll just say that this is one, two, three. Oop, no, two, three. Now we can do it. Boom. You can, your, your PCs, yeah, you know what? Uh, you, you start here, uh, it's in the middle of the week, which is good because the store's opened up, it's not the weekend anymore. Ah, you see what we can start doing now? Do you see that we can have the world be a living, breathing part of things? The stores are open, you can buy your materials, you start forging. Oh, you know, hey, you know what, you're in the middle of your project, that's fine, it's a thunderstorm, you can stay indoors for that. Oh, it's high feast. Well, okay, someone better, uh, someone better, uh, um, bring you some food because you're busy. You finish your project on day seven, and you and and the PC says, "Yes, I've done it. I've made this. Uh, I've made this sword." You know what? I I heard that the vizier got robbed, or there was an attempted robbery a couple days ago. I wonder if I could score some brownie points by trying to meet the vizier and present this to her as a gift to help keep her safe. DM, can we go see the vizier? And meanwhile, you're like, sure. They go to meet the vizier the next day and the vizier's in town, but they have to wait because the, whatever, the vizier's secretary is uh, saying that there's an important meeting with the, um, uh, with the fishmonger, the, the head fishmonger of the bay. And then they can present, and now we actually have a crossover point with the PCs. They've they've paid attention, even passively, to the environment and the story. You haven't had to go out of your way to, to make a ton of notes and scramble, because you have all this stuff. You know what's happening on day 10 of this month, in whatever categories that you want to put down here. Does this make sense to you all? And they only have to be reference points. You don't have to write a novel in every cell have it be uh have it just be reference points make it you can make it quick oh i've been missing some chat here uh da -da -da. <laughs> the villain is canadian says uh tavern also if the villain is hiding in plain sight they'll have duties or routine uh so yeah shadow that is correct uh, gets robbed on the way back. Helps to listen to the players speculate at the table. Yes, that is very good advice. That is excellent advice. Uh, average Joe. I'm at this intrigue part of my D&D campaign right now. PCs think the bad guy had an evil apprentice without me alluding to it at all. Wondering whether to let it ride or to make it uh, be a red herring or just reinforce it wasn't the case. And until the time comes when that has to be revealed, it could be whatever you need it to be in your story, Average Joe.
In my Saturday game, there's a cyclical destruction of society, as the world knows it every couple thousand years, and uh, things are looking to be on the verge of this again. And the PCs just found out that it is the way it is because the gods made a deal with a lith. Ooh, ooh. So maybe they want to go seek out a lithids then, right? <laughs> The sap, the fish. Oh, yeah, that's right, the, the the special sap. The sap, the fish, the way the moonlight strikes a landmark. Uh, there are all kinds of ways people found a city, sea trade, fresh water source. Exactly, Shadow. And Van, welcome. Great to have you here, Van. And you want to end that cycle? That's going to make for an, a great story, Coffee. The player characters estimate an important NPC. The DM uh, leans their leans, tents their fingers, and says, I thought you'd never ask. Yeah, and that in itself can be a reward at the tabletop. All right, so anyway, you get the idea. This is the exercise that you can employ, and if you if you want to run Intrigue, then having a table like this can help. You don't have to have it. I don't want you to go, oh, I have to plan everything from the tides to uh, to the, the daily machinations of my villain. No, you don't have to. I'm showing you what you can do and how it can help because as time passes and you say, what's going on on the 12th day of the month? Oh, this could even help you with um, monster generation. You want a random encounter? Well, it's, uh, it's a sunny day today. And so if you have a sunny day uh, and then you have, uh, you have encounter, um, you know, you have a, you have a sea you have water encounters and inland encounters or whatever. You, do you see how you can make this very rich and complex? Or you could simply just make it, uh, you know, uh, very Spartan and referential. But if it's a sunny day and they're on the sea, then you make a note that uh, use C chart one. But if it, you know, if it's a thunderstorm on the sea then that's C chart three. Whatever you'd like, however you want to do it. This is your game. That's not a throwaway statement. This is your game. And much like what we were talking about above, should I reveal something then and now? What should it end up being? It needs to be whatever it needs to be to you and your story to have fun and to enjoy it and to tell something cool and compelling. It's as easy as that. It's not a cop-out answer. Are you someone who loves the minutia of a world? Crack open this spreadsheet and go go ham on it. Make reference tables, make, you know, put the minutia of your several NPCs. Or just keep it, you know, keep it loosey-goosey. Uh here we have our villain. Uh our, our acquisition finished. Um and here we have uh hires and assassin uh, so the, the hiring takes place today to kill the old, uh, fish, like the harbor master or whatever, the fishmonger. And then fishmonger is assassinated. It's on the last day of the hurricane. You know, people are still kind of riding it out. Everyone's kind of, you know, no one really wants to go outside just yet. And of course, the fishmonger, though, uh, seeing that the weather's gonna break, has to go out and check the boats and whatever. And once you know, it's also during the super tide, so the water's already high. And you know what? Accidents happen. Accidents happen. And the fishmonger was, you know, out in stormy weather when the super tide was going on. And oopsie! Well, now the villain. Uh, doesn't even have uh, to keep uh, the manager as part of the contract, you know, where the fishmonger said, yeah, 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 you can do the waters. I'll tell you what, I'm kind of looking to retire anyway. Let me, uh, you know, you you own the rights, but I'm going to, I'm going to want to manage it. That's the only way I'll give it up. And the villain's like, sure. And then, well, the fishmonger ends up retiring and, <laughs> and now the property or the fishing rights revert solely to the villain. Have fun with your intrigue here, especially if you put two, three, four, five. 
if this isn't something like downtime, uh, put whatever court member one, or this could be uh, judge so and so, and then you make another one over here. You know, who are the big movers and shakers that are conspiring with and or against each other? And honestly, your intrigue would be threading these events back and forth. And if you know with your godlike DM powers what they're going to do, you can plot months of intrigue ahead of time and simply trust yourself that eventually when your players, when your players get a clue or want to meet with someone or interject, or if they come in at just the right time where judge so-and-so wants to make a power play and is willing to use your the players as a pawn, then you can influence the results that can happen when that occurs. Because you know what is supposed to happen, now just simply nudge the outcome as appropriate. That's the on-ramp to the, the involvement. And meanwhile, while the judge uh, has the party doing something against the main villain, the vizier, over here, if you made... Uh, to, you know, you made the dictator and then you made the, um, I don't know, uh, someone else that's very important, the sheriff of the city or, you know, the, the chief. You know, they have their own things going on too and you can see how that would plot out if there's no involvement and if there is, make the, make the changes on the fly and have it ripple forward or you can better plan and say, you know what, this is really going to be a one and done. It's not going to interfere ultimately with what's happening. But now you are empowered. You have not only you have not only the prompts given to you by your players for their characters. So you you hook the players into the story. The things that are going on in the world are going to be relevant to them because they're relevant to their characters. Because we have court intrigue. Because we have monsters of different varieties, elementals. We have uh, aberrations. We have these guilds. You can have this be as complex or not as you wish. But it can help you when you're planning something more, maybe more complex than, you know, just a simple beer and pretzels, kick in the door and kill the monster. If you have some kind of a reference chart, this is a reference chart. This is a reference chart. And you can, boop, put the two together and you have several referential notes. And if you need to change something on the fly, your players aren't seeing this. Change it. Adapt, have fun. Grimvex, nine months. <gasps> Grimvex, we have a Twitch baby. Congratulations. Also, enjoy your picture of Ice T icon now. Yeah, if you want to go lycanthrope stuff, exactly. Hey, Sharknado, welcome. I'm allergic to spreadsheets, but I'm tempted to do this since I have many factions doing their things simultaneously. Well, and see, we're not even doing any math or calculations on it. This is just a simple way to say, you know what? In the world I'm presenting, this is... The world continues. We're having this conversation, and right now, while we're talking about D&D, there are several cargo ships bringing manufactured goods from China through the Panama Canal to distribute to ports on the other side. And are we, are we having any influence? Are we having any influence on what's happening in the Panama Canal? Or is it happening out without us needing to interact with it? Right now, there are people flying to Japan on a vacation. Maybe it's a honeymoon or something. Are we having any influence on that? No, they're doing it themselves. The world continues on all around us until we want to interject ourselves. Until we want to go to Japan. Until we want to visit the Panama Canal, which is really cool, and I suggest you do it because it was fun. Have your world come alive and inve invest your, your players in your world. 
and be sure to have the meta conversation, just as we can't help a flight bound for Japan, you know, in its comings and, and goings. If you miss a prompt, you miss a prompt. It's fine. This isn't a 100% completion video game. This is us having fun and for you to explore what is relevant to your character. What is relevant to the character, to two of the characters, they want to bring down the tyrant and the evil people behind it. Your players are going to are going to interject themselves. Remember, the villain has already won. She already controls things from the shadows, is the puppet master to the dictator. She's on management. And maybe she slips up and overplays her hand, or she slowly grows ambitious, or honestly, she's just on the, the smooth and steady. Your players, with the presumption they want to play those types of characters and you approved them and then you built content on them, are going to interject themselves. And now you know at the entry point. Oh, hey, yeah. Two, uh, two year three pulls. I will uh, get your name on that right now. You are going to be number 23 and number 24, respectively, Van. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, uh, VTM coffee, and I, I, I made sure to mention that as well. So yeah, this doesn't have to be like super complex, format it however you want, color code stuff, do some cool like interweaving hyperlinks to other parts, to other cells, um, whatever. Have fun with it. Drake Blackbeard, ahoy to you. Yeah, an average Joe, uh, you know, keeping track of that at least vaguely on like a month, you know, this month, this month, the guild is going to do this the next month, you know, so it's giving your players a good time frame. You just know that this month, the guild wants to accomplish this task. Cool. It could be as simple as that. Or if you want to have the minutia of the day to day and you want to name all the NPCs, draw it out. Have fun with it. Oh, it's amazing, Van. And uh, I, if I pull that for someone, I mean, obviously, if all 50 capsules uh, sell out uh, for the drawing, someone's going to get the falling star. It's guaranteed. But even if, I, even if all 50 don't, I still would look forward uh, to pulling that for someone. It is an amazing set piece. So, this is our this is a, a tool we can use as well. Make a simple outline with a word document. It can be um it can be not even specific to dates or actions. You can have it be a reference of life continues as it has something happens and the next big plot point is the vizier owns the ports something happens in between and the next big step is uh the vizier uh the vizier clears the li uh, the religious library or the religious library slash uh, monastery. Or we'll just call it mon a monastery. <laughs> What's the next big move? It's simple plot points. And these even could be separated from date. You just, it, it's going to happen at some point. And if you feel the time is right to have it happen, then have it happen. Things happen in the interim. And if the, if the players get involved somewhere along uh, these lines here, then that could affect your the other goals. 
you can have it be, um, you can have it be more complex, right? We made NPCs. We have this sub villain as well, and you can set it up as milestones. So, um, our level one to two mile to reach level two, this is what happens. Level two to three, this is the goal. Level three to four, this is the goal. Level five to six. And you know what? If you want everyone to start at level five, because you want everyone to already be established in their community, uh, you want everyone to already have a dabbling of their powers, which is fine. Some people just skip over the one through three and start at a higher level. And you might even say, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to run a quick, you know, we're, we're going to go to level 10. And then we have our climax. You can have it be goal-based. If it's intrigue, they have to discover something. So in order for them to get from five to six, they can take two months of downtime and craft five magic swords. Okay. The machinations are still going to happen, but if they want to hit level six, uh, th they have to get introduced uh, into the... Uh, into the story somehow, and that could be uh, complete three missions from the Hunter's Guild. You And you could set that up to be like tutorial stuff, like combat, or, you know, to send them out and plant clues. You know, if you send them on three missions, maybe you put three different clues, because some people are better with puzzles or a certain type of, you know... They watch CSI, so they like murder, like murder scene clues. Some people are more Sherlock Holmes, put the, you know, put a bunch of disparate clues together kind of a thing. So you, you know, to get to level six uh, in the, on the milestone system, they have to complete the missions. Now, the clues along the way would lead them into investigating, um, you know, this would lead, uh, conclude that the hunter guild leader is possessed by a dead relative and cure her of the possession. Could cure her mean kill her? Possibly. However, that NPC is linked to at least two of our PCs. But you know what? It could happen. Or they could seek a, a religious route. Or they could perform the magic themselves. But this is the goal you're looking for. And now that the, and so in, in so much as they've defeated the ghost, they might learn a clue that leads them into the next big part of the intrigue because the, the ghost as it departs, um, ends up, uh, dropping, I don't know, the ghost uh, had a, I don't know, the ghost haunted a, a metal that belonged to the dictator's family. And so, you know, we can kind of throw them off that it's the vizier. And so in this case, if they get the, the metal that was the conduit of the ghost and the relative or whatever, again, have fun and generate these on your own to come up with these prompts. I'm just making this up off the top of my mind from the things that we, we've known because we've gone through some other very simple exercises down here. To get to level eight, uh, they have to uh, secure a meeting with the dictator to return the metal left by the ghost. You want to put extra notes here? Uh, whenever this happens, because again, you could have it be a floating time, or you could have the dictator set a firm uh, date, in which case, boop, put it on your planner. Whenever this happens, it will be at a dinner, and the party, um, the party will be attacked uh, by quote unquote rogue agents in order to try and secure their loyalty and throw off anyone getting close to the puppet dictator. 
so that the vizier can continue her manipulations without worry. Of course, during the conflict, or if you want it to be this way, it could be this could be purely social. This could be just a combat. It could be a slobber knocker. However, we learn something that perhaps points us over to the vizier, and you know what could happen that could do that? One of our characters can speak with the dead. There's also, if you take a look, huh, if we're building an adventure to where our skill sets, to where our skill sets are, remember our party has at least one party member that is proficient in each of the intelligence scores or uh, intelligence skills. Not that non-proficient people can't make checks. Hashtag just saying. Let, let the simple half an hour, and it, it could take even less if you're not presenting it to a bunch of people. I'm not complaining about that. Have this help guide. Ah, oh, so what can we use? What can we pluck from this in order to advance the story? And so now we come... What is what is our, our milestone that's going to level them up next? They learn that the vizier is the true villain manipulating the court and dictator from behind the scenes. However, they cannot act on it without proof. Nice and simple. Get proof. That could be the goal. You don't know how they're going to get proof. Leave it open for them. What do they consider to be proof? Climax. Fight the vizier in the um, evacuated monastery located atop the coastal monolith which bears the historical inscriptions from the founders of the city. Boom! We've used the map. We've used the setting. All of this stuff has been setting up in the background that leads to this area right here. <laughs> this is the climactic fight. It leads to... Because this is where the vizier... Right? This is where the vizier was heading. Eventually. Boop, 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 boop. And you know what? This could take three days. This could take three weeks or months. Getting proof? Get proof could be they need to go from the city up the river and off the map into a neighboring town because that they learned the vizier had visited someone out of town a month prior. Oh, do you see how this can come together? Even if broadly, it gives you referential points. It creates uh, little psychological gateways for you to make these decisions on the fly that create a coherent experience at your tabletop. Get proof could take three months. And it then leads to the big climax that could go back to the, the founding story. It can go back to the themes that have been explored. And you know what? If we're making an adventure outline, you know, these could just simply be, uh, you know, if we make a bullet point, here's our header. And then here is, you know, Here's our first bullet point, and then we come down here, and then this is, you know, oh, ah. but you, you get what I'm saying. They become further indented to get to the more detailed parts uh, underneath each header as you're making a traditional outline. Does that make sense? And here you have 
You have guided information. You have open world information. All of this leads to intrigue, especially if the intrigue still happens all around them. And you don't have to worry about it because you know what's going to happen in three days. And if you take this down far enough, you know exactly what's going to happen in three months. Or at least you have a broad idea of what's going to happen. Enough that it makes you comfortable to, to call the shots on the fly as you're sitting at your table. And really, as the DM, that you, you could have thought about this. You could have plotted everything for two years that led to this moment. Or you could have just said, yeah, that sounds right. Make it happen. And yet, in that moment, in that moment of immediacy, regardless of how you did it, you did it. And there's the story. There's the prompt. There's the next mission. There's the gates to the open world opening up after a little bit of choo-choo. Or maybe that's the open world closing behind you, and now boop, you're set on your railroad for a bit. Sorry, I missed some chat here. Um... Coffee Cat, you're talking about your paladin and wanting to break that cycle. Uh, faction members might be involved in multiple events. Exactly, Shadow. And uh, hello, Awaz. Why Blarg? Extra stubborn. Uh, Drake says, I have heard the legal stupid was gone with 5e. Uh, yeah, there is no there is no alignment mechanic to paladins, Drake. And no, you're not forced into that. Not by default. You can have your paladin play that way if you wish. And Coffee, I'm glad that you're playing to your oath. That's very important, and I'm glad that you said that. Yeah, and Shadow, maybe the Vizier steps in, you know, at the at the last moment. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm late to the dinner. Look out! <laughs> And, you know, like cast spells or uh, or what have you, um, you know, ah, and uh, and, you know, maybe when when the the assassin was dying, you know, there's just that kind of like, why? And then and then, then, of course, you know, your, your players, your players are happy that the the dictator safe. But then the one that caught that, why, why would an assassin say that and to the vizier of all people? Anyway, yeah, it's a good idea. You're going to sleep? Yeah, oh, and yeah, Detroit by Night is going to be... It's Sunday night over at Macabre Derrick. Coffee, if you want to drop a link, please do so. And thanks for hanging out with us, Coffee, and talking about your paladin. Yeah, we had a... <laughs> Ta-da! You see this here? This could be a straightforward plot of intrigue that takes you on a whirlwind tour of the setting... Or you can have this be as complicated a uh, Tom Clancy or John Grisham or whatever. A, a good, like, suspense intrigue writer. Right? These are the overarching goals that would just lead to mechanical level ups. How do you get there? And you might you might say, you know what, I wanna I wanna mix this up. I want that I want there to be, you know, sort of a uh um you know, to, to get here, there does, of course, have to be the sub-boss fight. And before that, you could even say that there's a... Before you can get to the sub-boss fight, I want uh, I want to see four social interactions. Or, you, or if not social interactions, a uh, successful NPC uh, bonds. And then you can go back... Oh, you know what this is getting into? You know what this is getting into, my friends? Another fun and easy way to plot out what you want to have happen in your story. And let me show you. Uh, 
I call this the midpoint method. That might be the actual name for it, but I just know that I've called it the midpoint method. <laughs> yeah, and coffee, th thank you for sharing that and for the prompt. Derek does an amazing job at running a, a game of intrigue. And also after he presents Vampire the, uh, the Masquerade, he runs a VTM workshop where you can ask him questions about about uh, storytelling, about the mechanics of vampire, about uh, how to present horror, about, I don't know, what, what you would have questions about. Definitely go check him out, please. All right, the midpoint method. What is this? The midpoint method, as you are seeing above, is a way where you start with your big ideas, right? Our opening. And then our climax. Big fight. Atop. The. Um, atop the. Monastery. Monolith. In a storm. Yeah. You can visualize it. The wind whipping around the lightning. The sea 200 feet below. Crashing up. Everything is riding on the line. You're in the presence of the gods and of history and the founders of the city. Yes, I can imagine it. This is how I want my story to end. I'm speaking with energy. I'm using body language. I'm excited. I want this to happen. And some people might speak similarly or just as creatively. The opening. It's a cool coastal spring day with only a few clouds hanging in the skies above the boats in the bay. The tide is gently... You see? You, you, you get a difference? The tide is gently rolling in. And your guild leader greets you saying that she has a mission for you. You may want some help with this one, but she trusts you. Cool. We have our big opening. We have our big climax. And then you say, oh, no. How do, how do we get from A to B? Well, instead of B, we say, how do we get from A to Z? Ah, all right. Something has to happen in the middle. Well, ask ourselves, what leads us from a quiet, cool coastal spring day to a big fight atop uh, a monastery in a storm with the vizier of the lands, who's the big bad evil guy? Midpoint. If you don't want to call it midpoint, you can put this turning point. They learn the vizier is the BBEG. Okay. Well, now, all right, so that's how they get from the opening to the climax. Now what? It's simple. You go to the midpoint. You go to the midpoint. So here, opening, we'll call this opening midpoint. How do we get from a, a cool, simple, uh, you know, this is a mission entrusted to you by a friend to learning the Vizier's the BBEG? Well, what's the halfway mark? What, what shifts the momentum in the story? And you say, all right, no, I, I can figure this out. It would probably have to do with, um, you know, it'd probably have to do with the missions. Um, after proving they can be trusted, the group is given a new kind of mission. Now, 
now take a look how do we get from the turning point the vizier is the big bad evil guy now how do we get to the climax out in the middle of the of the sea where the storm is raging through and wind and all this other stuff so let's call this our climax midpoint okay um this uh they learn the vizier is the big bad evil guy they have the fight aha they have to prompt the fight. The proof of guilt is found forcing the villain's hand and things get dire more quickly. Right? Now we're accelerating the story from this point because she's no longer safe. She can't sit back for the first 75% of the story and let things be simple and continue because they're onto her. Nope, I missed a couple things here. You like to give the players a chance to join either side of the faction? That's, oh, that's nice of you, Joe. Shadow says, good to see more night people storytelling again. LA, Long Beach, Seattle, Detroit. Mm-hmm. You meet the the vizier's evil informant, and we'll we'll get to that uh, in a second. Now you say, "All right, uh, I I still I feel like I'm stuck. I'm kind of hamming up the the character, but maybe maybe some of you want to continue doing this. Do you, do you get the pattern we're gonna go for? What are we gonna do? Oh, all right. So what is the midpoint? Between the opening on a cool spring day where your skills are being put to the test by someone who you trust and there's really no pressure to proving that you can be trusted. Well, now, so th this could be, um, if you want to have that be like opening midpoint, you could label this as something else. You could simply give a, I don't know, uh, uh, another sign or something. Uh, and so we go through, and this could be, well, uh, th this could be one of the, the missions. In fact, this could end up being uh, one of the moral conundrums, where you can say, um, you know, if they can prove they can be trusted, then perhaps uh, we have two traditional hunts of, uh, of targets. One is easy... The other is harder mechanically. And, but if we want to complete three missions and to reach this turning point after they prove they can be trusted, if you want to put another midpoint, we'll have this be a minus. And we can have this be a minus as well. What's the midpoint between here and here and here and here? The last mission is one that is mechanical, but also challenges their morals. And you come down here. And you say, oh, shoot. Well, how do we get from proving they can be trusted to learning the Vizier's the big, bad, evil guy? Well, shoot. How do I get from this midpoint I just made? Hopefully this is making sense. Do you see how all you have to do? Right? Go with what's big and passionate. Go with the first, like, what is the turning point in the middle of each of these? And you see how it ripples through your story? Do you see how it can make those decisions easier? You start with the big, passionate things. The swirling storm with the big, bad, evil guy fight. Or the, the beautiful introduction with the sounds of water and caca of the seabirds and other things. And if you're ever hard up for how do you get from one place to the next, draw out your adventure like this. You can use the midpoint method. 
and or use this calculator tool use the use the scheduling tool and or use milestones and and because you know what you need to have accomplished and as a dm if you have a simple goal in mind that lets you be very flexible with how that goal is achieved you know for many for many of us we might think of storytelling as it, it has to be either a railroad or it has to be a sandbox. For many of us, that seems to be all people talk about or all we think about storytelling. Is that true? I mean, are the, these are terms that I'm sure many of you out there are aware of, right? You're aware of railroad and sandbox. Can I challenge you? Can I challenge you with a third type of storytelling? A way Well, uh, modular modular is a methodology, I suppose. No, no, you're, you're correct, Shadow. And I, I, and honestly, that, that would be sandbox style, right? The world just takes place. Uh, I, I, I guess I'm speaking in, in very... Uh, I mean, many of you out there might be above and beyond the traditional... You're either railroading your players or you're, you're letting them play in a sandbox. Can I have you... Can I have you think of it like this? Choo choo. I don't want to make too many, otherwise I can't control Z back out of it. It's very direct. The story is... Here's a sandbox. Hey, Half Demon Dan. It looks like a it looks like a family circus cartoon on a Sunday paper. <laughs> they can play in the sandbox. They're still in bounds, but there's there's a lot of room to play. It doesn't have to be direct. They can go here and there. You know, it could still be confining, or because they have too many options, it can feel overwhelming. Yeah. Can I offer this as a way to look at storytelling? As a way to be engaging? And you might... You might have seen that I have alluded to this during the presentation. Now, whether or not you're aware of it, I don't know. We'll see. But maybe some of the verbiage and the actions that I've taken on camera may very well resonate with this.
You want to hook your players in. You want to get the characters in. When you're fishing, when you're fishing, there is ultimate progress to get the fish to the boat. In this case, it's the goal. What do you want the story to accomplish, whether it's in part or in whole? A masterful fisherman a f masterful fisherman won't just rip the hook towards him. Do you see what the fish can do? The fish can go this way. The fish can go this way. The fish can even go this way. And then the fish can go this way and this way, but then back this way. And then the fish can go this way and this way. And we actually repeat that a couple times. And then the fish goes this way. And then the fish goes this way. And then the fish goes here. What do you notice? What do you notice about this concept? What do you notice about this concept of storytelling as a dungeon master? Average Joe says there's always progress. If we're starting here, here's a plot point. Here's a plot point. Here's a plot point. Here's a plot point. And a plot point. And a plot point. And a plot point. And a plot point. These are all making progress. The fish, your player characters, have freedom to move, in a sense. This fish, this fish may feel like it, you know, it, it is. There is forward movement. But you know what? This can be jarring, unnatural. This can cause disinterest or panic or the feeling of giving up. If your fish can wiggle as it's trying to flee and then feel good that it made some progress and then it feels that next tug and it says, whoa, hold on, I'm going to go over here. And then the fish, see, the fish has room to wiggle, to grow. Well, not really to grow in the fishing term. Then your fish says, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm totally, I'm, I'm in control. We're going to go this way. The fisherman know the fisherman's in it for the long game. The fisherman knows the, the hook is set and you're just going to have a constant, a constant reel. You play the long game. You play the patience game. You let the fish, you let the fish go. Because there's always that constant progress. You ultimately, as the fisherman, have control, but you don't force the control because that panics the fish. It sours the meat. It could tear the hook. It could damage your boat or your gear. So you ride with the fish. You make every inch that you, you can reel in is an inch closer. Guaranteed that fish is to you. It's guaranteed striding. The fish... Do you see how we've been able to sort of fuse this concept of 
Well, here's a sandbox. Oh, this is awesome. We can be anywhere, but really, we're still confined. And where are we? We don't have a reference point. We're just... We're set in a world. Okay, cool. Pardon. Maybe you're given a quest to go explore the corner of the sandbox. Choo-choo! Direct. And I'm not calling either one intrinsically bad. These are just the two concepts, sandbox and railroad, that we're most familiar with and mo many people talk about it. One, you could just get lost because there's nothing to do or there's no direction because you can go anywhere. The other is only direction. You can only go in one place. Can I urge you, if you don't already, as a dungeon master, can I urge you to consider telling your story, especially in a political intrigue game, especially in that. Now, again, you have a beer and pretzel. You want to play uh, the kick in the door and kill the monster? Choo choo. And everyone's aboard. It's the party train. All, all aboard. Drinks are included. We're going to have a fun Saturday night. You could have a ton of fun with, with uh, these, depending on the context. But especially in an intrigue game, play the long game. Be the patient, wise fisherman in the boat. And let, let your party slowly uncover the impending situation. You know, to this point, they're swimming free in the ocean. Oh, cool. We get a couple beginner quests. Nom, 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 nom. Yeah, we're eating. We're eating good tonight. Uh-oh. This quest had a hook in it. And you know what? A good fisherman probably also has... A couple other hooks in the water and when there's a hit on one the fisherman is going to go and it's going to be the same procedure because you know what whether your party is hooked on this quest or this quest the party is still going to go whoa 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 bub, 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 and then get landed or the party is going to go whoa 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 whoa, whoa, whoa and get landed or the party is going to go, whoa, 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 and get landed. They have freedom of movement and direction. But it's a gentle coursing direction instead of a jarring one. Th does this metaphor make sense? And you know what? As the fisherman, your line may snap. You know what, though? That fish, that fish is going to get hungry again, as fish do. And it's going to have to bite again. And maybe instead of red bait, you cast blue bait or orange bait next time. With that as the metaphor, thinking back throughout the broadcast week have I done have I talked about hooking your players have we talked about especially in the setting have we talked about fishing and the tides and the cycles has there been allusion to that by playing by indicating you can play the long game as detailed as you want or with just some simple notes it's here and it's been here the whole time and as we conclude the broadcast week as we conclude this final adventure for Maddie Morgs year two I hope you see that the workshop has been an adventure itself we started with nothing. 
We started with a blank character sheet. We built four characters randomly. We built references. We built the party as a cohesive unit. We built a setting based on the party. We, base, we built a map based on the setting. We built NPCs built on the map, on the setting, on the party. We built villains on the NPCs, on the map, on the setting, on the party. And now we've built an adventure upon the villains the NPCs, the map, the setting, the party, and ultimately, our friends who started this adventure by handing us a completed character sheet with a fun little Beastmaster Ranger Totem Barbarian. That was the first character we generated for this adventure. With a, with a very lazy Blade Warlock of the Fiend. Someone who's going into anger management because he doesn't like his hot temper. With... The adventure began with a simple farm girl who delivered, uh, you know, some prize, uh, some prize food to the palace and got taken into the corruption and was bitter about it. Our fourth adventurer, technically the third we built, a courtier who wanted to see a better world and has been slowly, painfully working it from the inside with his influence. These simple characters that I'm not necessarily, like I referenced Ranger Barbarian, but that was more for the uniqueness of like a fun idea brought in. I didn't reference them by their by their race and their class. We could. I reference the characters by who they are. What do they do? How do they do it? Those are the characters we built. These simple characters. And these four characters, over the course of our workshop, have grown and developed themselves, let alone an entire region, now has an economy, an ecology, topography, cartography, oceanography, a climate, a holiday schedule, and an entire cast of characters that we can flesh out that all are cohesive and support each other and everything that has been built from four randomly generated characters from dice rolls from you all in chat. Random dice rolls and a splash of imagination. Do you see what we've built? And we did this over the course of a week. You can do this. I'm probably preaching to the choir if a lot of you are DMs out there. Because you already know you can. Are you thinking about being a DM? Have I demonstrated that you can do this? I hope so, because you can. You can deliver a wonderful story of your own creation. Well, I guess that'd be the plural you, because we are, you know, it's a joint effort between the players and the DM. It's entirely possible. And I hope it's not scary. And I hope it's, it's not, you know, you don't feel that you need some advanced degree or something. We we have a spreadsheet and a Word document and an MS Paint so I could squiggle some metaphor over here for you. Thank you very much for the follow, as you wish. Sometimes players need time to grow in the world to overcome... Yeah, exactly, Shadow. 
uh, came in on cell phone to say, hey, it's busy waiting, nothing to, for it to happen, waves at everyone. All right, be well, Bubonic. Thank you for stopping in and saying hi. Average Joe says, how do you handle players who want different styles? You have to talk about that in session zero, Joe. It, it, it really helps. Not that things can, you know, grow over time or change, but you, session zero is a very, uh, in my opinion, a very important thing to have. Breaking up the intrigue with a good old dungeon crawl to level them up. Shadow, absolutely. That's what the Tuesday game is doing right now. Shh, don't tell my Tuesday players. Yeah, Joe, there, there needs to be a... All right, everyone, we got to sit down and talk about this. And have a meta conversation. And then find a way to, to translate the meta conversation uh, into, into the game. And by creating that kind of a fun challenge, you'll actually get... Well, you should get engagement from your players about that. Hey, West River Wreck, good to see you. Let the characters that want to kick down the doors take on many adventures in town... Uh, while the others are trying to curry favor. As you wish. No, thank you. Very informative. Awesome stream. Well, as you wish. Thank you very much. You you found some some rando on Twitch uh, running uh, D and D, but it's not D and D. He has a bunch of squiggles on his uh, on his uh, uh, his uh, screen here. You you gave us a chance. You stopped in, and I'm glad that you did, and that you are getting some good content you, that you were looking for. 